Welcome to Between the Horns, presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers, Cameron Irwin, alongside my good friends, Stu Jackson and Maurice Jones-Drew. The Rams coming off a bye week and a bye week for us as well. Did you get any rest at MJD? I don't think you did, but maybe Stu, did you get some rest? Uh, a little bit. I mean, played some golf and... Wow. Uh, That's the way you should spend that, a bye week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> play a little bit of golf and then just watch a lot of college football and uh, you know, all the NFL games that were on the schedule for that week. So, yeah, well spent, at least by my standards. So I, I'm jealous. <laughs> got to watch football. You got to watch games. Yep. That was awesome. Uh, bye week was a work week for me. I was just getting back from London. Um, that was awesome over there besides the Jags uh, losing to the Bears, which have gotten much better since we played them. Mm-hmm. My goodness, yeah. both offensively and defensively. Um, but, yeah, still a little jet lagged. But we'll figure it out. We're going to fight through this thing. I'm going to give you everything I got. I, I was, just for our fans, and while I was over there, I was keeping tabs. I was texting JB. I was watching the games. I was doing everything I could to kind of keep stay intact. So I'm really excited for this week. And, and really after this bye week was kind of the plan on the Rams getting back healthy and making a run like last year. I was going to say MJD may have no idea what time zone he currently is. But <laughs> no, I think I'm in China right now. <laughs> no clue, but we're excited to break down the Los Angeles Rams after this bye week. It is the Raiders at SoFi Stadium come Sunday. And I feel like before we get into any major adjustments coming out of the bye week, let's take a look at what the state of the Rams is after the first five, sitting at one and four. However, is it as rough as it may seem? We saw Sean McVay talk with JB Long earlier this week, and he said the gap may not be as wide as we imagine it to be. Is that the case? I would say so. I mean, look at the standings for the NFC West. Mm-hmm. Like it, there. I mean, record-wise, there's not as much separation as as people may think. I mean, yes, it it is what it is as far as you know, especially where the Rams stand. But there's not a lot of separation right now, and there's still several weeks left to make up ground. There's two home games in five days for the Rams to potentially make up that ground, especially. So uh, not not as insurmountable as people may think. Hey, um, I think when you look at kind of the schedule, and it's not necessarily the, just the record wins and losses. It's how you won and how you lost. Right. You go back to week one, you you win the overtime with the Detroit Lions. Uh, week two, you get blown out by Arizona. So that kind of is one of those ones. But then you beat the Niners. Uh, then you have. Close, close losses. You should have. Uh, I, we the the Rams dominated the Bears game for what three and a half quarters, mm-hmm. and allowed the Bears to to take the lead late in the game, and then kind of go from there. And then obviously against Green Bay, you have opportunities in that game to win it. You get the the pick six. You get in the red zone again uh, a lot of times, and it's not the twenty to the twenty. It's more the the twenty in where the Rams have struggled, which has cost them those games. So if you can fix those red zone problems. You can at least say the Rams could be three and two or four and one at this point. Um, and having that ability to go again, the red zone has been something that's kind of started last year towards the end of the season. And it's kind of carried as well, like head over to this one. So hopefully that's what you were looking for after the buy is we're not as far away because we've had opportunities to win these games, but we just haven't converted in the red zone. And there is an accountability to that, right? Like there's an understanding of maybe it's a bit of inexperience. The Rams, the second youngest team in the NFL on average, just 25 and a half years. Uh, But there's also a different level of a bit of frustration because it feels like it's just within your reach, right? We're talking about one possession games that the Rams have taken losses in. How do you go about fixing some of those issues and those controllables in a bye week like this? Well, I think the biggest thing was coming into this season, you knew that the defense was going to take a little bit of time to get adjusted, right? Because you lost Aaron Donald, you traded away, you know, Jalen Ramsey. It was going to be a younger defense. The offense was going to carry the season. They were going to be the ones you're going to lean on the offense. The offense is going to score points, allow the defense to come along. And then you have a bunch of injuries that happen. And so now it's, okay, we got to figure out how to make yeah. this thing move while it's going. And so the, those losses and those plays that, that mistake, mistakes were made, both offensively, defensively, um, you can learn from those. And you're hoping that in this bye week that you go back over kind of what was going on. This is the technique we need to play. This is what we need to call in this situation. These are the communication techniques that we need. And then you hope the young guys can make those adjustments and go. But I've always said this, and I, I've said this a couple of times on the show, those – Injuries become blessing in disguises because guys are getting reps that normally wouldn't have gotten any reps. Uh, Bo Limmer to, to sh- comes to mind is you have a guy that comes in as a rookie that's playing meaningful, you know, reps throughout the first half of your season. Once everyone gets healthy, do you pull them? Do you keep them? And even if you do, 
you have a guy that you know you can count on down the road. And to that point, the wide receiver room especially, I think, has also benefited from that too. A lot of guys have gotten reps that they maybe wouldn't otherwise if you had had a healthy Cooper Cup, a healthy Puka Nakua, uh, which is really bringing along the depth there and then putting it in a good place, especially for the rest of the season. Stu, you have an incredible pulse on the team. You're in the practice facility day in and day out. What have you seen in this week? Because there was an added practice on Monday. Yeah, I mean, the the vibes have been good. I mean, everybody feels really refreshed and, um, you know, recharged and ready to go. I mean, again, as, as cliche as that sounds, the truth, just from, you know, talking to guys on Monday and, and Wednesday and just, you know, seeing, you know, obviously how, you know, Sean McVay feels this week. Um, you know, everybody feels like they're in a really good space to be able to, uh, you know, attack this week and, and get back on track. I like that you were use the word energy because even from some of the pressers that we've seen, it seems like that energy is starting to build and there's a confidence that's starting to build because there can be parallels drawn from this season to last season. They were three and six going into the bye, then ultimately winning seven of their last eight. How do you use last season in terms of building that confidence? Because that's something they can hang on to. Yeah, I think you talked about the controllables, right? And as yeah. a player, you can control your effort and your energy. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you can control. Now, there's other things that we as pros, we like to con we like to say we control. But <laughs> those are the two main things. And so for me, when you have those effort and energy plays like the pick six that happened against the Packers, when you can start to cultivate that and get more consistent play like that, all of a sudden it becomes contagious. Right. And so to me, I think when you look at just the Rams in general, um, if you go back to the Niners game, that was a very contagious game with that effort and energy that they played with can you stack it up the next week? And that's kind of where you have young guys. It's hard to do that week after week because, again, again, I remember being a young guy and I remember, like, going crazy one week and then being exhausted. Like, what? <laughs> I just emptied the bucket. How do I How do I empty the bucket again, right? Um, and you learn. You start to learn a routine. You start to learn, do I, get, do I come early all the time? Like, you start to figure out who you are as a player and then you start to fit your role. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned – with this Rams team compared to last one is there's a lot of role players on this one. Mm -hmm. Guys that are going to tutu Atwell is a role player, right? And we talked about roles being um, uh, or growing because of injuries. That's what he's, – he's a guy that we didn't see for, for a while last year. Mm -hmm. Then he comes in, he starts making plays. Now you have a role. Now you have to be the best in that role as possible. And, and that, it goes for everybody. And so if you can control your effort and your energy and your attitude, then I think it will turn around. Like I think by the same token, too, that uh, question you asked reminded me of what I had asked Matthew Stafford post game after the Green Bay game, where I said, you know, obviously every season, each season is its own story. But, you know, what do you draw on from a leadership standpoint or what can you use from last season to apply to the current circumstances? And he basically said, you know, you can't be scared to put yourself out back out there regardless of what your record is. And mm -hmm. so playing with that fearlessness is, is one of the things that at least that I think about or go back to in light of that. Yeah, and you mentioned Tutu, and I think something just popped into my head in regards to you earn the right for expectation, right? And each of these guys has now put performances together, especially at the wide receiver group where you're going, there's now expectation on them to perform in the second half. Uh, also, I want to note, you talked about the Bears' improvement, and you just look at what the Rams have faced. You thought maybe that first half wasn't going to be as tough in terms of strength of schedule, but now, considering the NFC North, of our five competitions, three of them against the NFC North, they're 17-5. and five as a yeah. division leading the NFL. The strength of schedule in the front half for the Los Angeles Rams has been a daunting task. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you knew, especially with opening the, the uh, with the home opener, I should say, being against the 49ers, that that was always going to be a tough challenge, obviously, own division. But yeah, especially with the way that the uh, the NFC North is shaping up with the way the, the Packers are playing as well. Um, you know, those are going to be some really good tests that I think the you know, the Rams will look back on and, and be, you know, appreciative of the growth or opportunities that came from it. And I, I again, when you talk about um, the Bears and their growth, they just really turned around and started running the ball, became more of a 50-50 offense. Understand that their defense has always been really good. We saw that firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with the Rams, it's, it's the opposite, right, where we needed offense to get back to being that explosive team that's scoring 28 points, getting, you know, two touchdowns early in the game, putting pressure on the other side to allow the defense – uh, to continue to grow. And it's not necessarily the front end of the defense that I'm worried about. Cause again, Jared Verson, 
Fisk have done an amazing job of adding to Byron Young and Kobe Turner and the pressure they're bringing in. But it's it's the second part of it, right? That's coverage on the back end, the linebackers being able to cover in space. Mm-hmm. You have, now have to take over. And, and I think that's going to be the next step for this Rams defense is can that, that, that front, if it's five guys, if it's four guys, if it's three guys, can you get pressure on the quarterback consistently? And consistently meaning every snap, right? The quarterback has to either move his pocket or take his eyes off of off of the routes so that you can help those guys in the back and as they get healthy a healthier and start to play better. Especially too, because some of the things that you know the Rams do in terms of you know coverage structures or, or the way they approach the secondary ties into those rush plans as well, right? And the way they rush the passer. <laughs> it was so funny when I first got with the Rams. I was like, this is so unsound what they're doing. It was just, it was like unbelievable. Just some of the coverage things, but. When you have Aaron Donald who can get pressure in two seconds, it's like <laughs> we have the luxury of doing that, right? And so I think now you're – again, it's a learning process. This is what we've done for the last – I know we've been here since 2016, so what, eight, nine years is the last one we've done, and now we have to switch it up. And that's a learning process. How do how do we switch it up? Do we do we run more stunts on the front? Do we play tighter coverage on the back end? Do we – like? and so, again, we knew the first couple of weeks it was going to take some time, but I thought the Rams' defense have done an awesome job of getting off the field – uh, they've converted a lot of those pressures into sacks as of lately. Um, you just hope that they can continue that growth as they keep going. And then, you know, the last thing I'll say is this. When you're asking rookies to play a lot and to play and to uh, be impact players, the rookie wall is the most is the one thing that you have to worry about. And having that buy early is going to kind of push that wall back a little bit because, again, mm-hmm. they shouldn't be worn down as much. Well, you gave me a beautiful transition because I was just about to ask you about Jared Burst and Kobe Turner and that pass rush uh, and the optimism that you can find, but you detailed it beautifully. I'll give you one more in terms of a silver lining. Kobe Turner had a great performance uh, against Green Bay, six tackles, two for loss, two sacks, and two QB hits. So looking for that consistency, but that is a huge step in the right direction. All right, let's shift gears. The NFC West is technically up for grabs. You look at what (laughs) the rest of the field looks like, the Seahawks 49ers and Cards 49ers and Seahawks at three and three, Cards at two and four. 49ers have a tough test this week. They face the Chiefs. Seahawks have the Falcons, who are also four and two, and the Cardinals take on the Chargers for Monday Night Football, who are at three and two. You look at strength of schedule. And this is a little interesting to close this out for the NFC West. The top of the order in terms of strength of schedule remaining is San Francisco and then Seattle, the Rams at three in the division. This could really work in their favor. And I already asked, is it that far out of reach? The numbers and history don't go our direction. However, the Rams have proven it before. So what do you feel like they have to do? Do they have to pick up both of these wins in the next five days? I I don't want to say it's, it's, must win to that extent but i do think i mean yeah they do need to take advantage of having these two home games in five days especially when you consider that you'll be when you do resume uh you know traveling or or road play that you're going to be at seattle uh at the beginning of november Mm -hmm. so uh getting a couple wins in this stretch would be absolutely huge like i said earlier for not only making up that ground but also just uh, you know, getting yourself on the right track and, and being in a good space going into um, what's obviously one of the most challenging road environments in the league. It, it's funny. Um, I feel like every game is a must win in the NFL just because of <laughs> how certain teams play against certain teams. Um, but it's funny how Arizona has been playing lately after they played the Rams, right? It's, it's, that wasn't the same team. They haven't been the same team no. we've seen in week, since week two, which <laughs> is very interesting. And the Niners have their own issues trying to figure out offensive without CMC, they have a lot of guys banged up, and they've been struggling as well. And you're right, this is going to be a tough game. This is almost a game for the the Niners that they need to win to get confidence to feel like they're back that team that can contend in Super Bowls. And then if you look at Seattle, Seattle was three and zero, right? And all of a sudden they've lost they've lost three straight. And there's something going on where they can't figure it out. I mean, and they're losing to teams that you feel like they should have had the handle, especially at home, right? Because it's always tough to go to the Northwest from anywhere. And so. Uh, to me, I think the Rams are in prime position. Prime position meaning early in the year, there was a lot of expectation. Mm-hmm. Everyone was kind of buzzing. You know, you were coming back, all these things. And that expectation kind of dropped a little bit, which means you're under the radar. And if you can just stack one win, which is, again, this Raiders team, they, they're, there's a lot of um, – uh, uh, they're all messed up. I don't even know what, the, this, what it's called, but – 
Again, I'm in China right now. Discombobulated? <laughs> Discombobulated. Is that the word you were looking for? <laughs> no, I, I just feel like <laughs> they're... going to be my guess. <laughs> yeah, well, they have a fracture in their locker room right now, okay. right? When you trade away Devontae Adams, you know, as much as I love Antonio Pierce, who I was a good friend of mine, played against him, grew up with him, coached against him. Uh, he's trying to create a certain culture there, right? And so they have some issues that they're fighting through right now. This is a great time to kind of get a nice jump start on a team that's that's trying to figure out who they are. And then you get the Minnesota Vikings at home on a Thursday. And the best part about that is if you're able to win to, uh, Sunday, win Thursday, that Thursday game is going to be huge because that's top of the NF NFC right now, yeah. right? The Minnesota Vikings are the top, the upper echelon of the NFC. So if you're able to find a way to get that victory, then all of a sudden now you have confidence rolling in. And then you can go into Seattle, energy, effort, confidence we're playing better we're doing what we need to do and you know i think again that that's the biggest thing the biggest issue for our fans is never a talent issue in the nfl it's always who's more confident in their scheme and what they're doing and so that's kind of what you're hoping that the rams get these next two weeks is that they can go while these other teams are having to fight this uphill battle you're under the radar and you can just chop away game after game and find a way to win it I love it. All right, let's reset offensive and defensive play coming out of the bye. Maybe some adjustments that we might see. The good news is there's been a lot of talk about Cooper Cup this week. There's potential that we may see him. It's, is that true? Is that For true? We look purposes, at Stu. I'm just saying I have him. He's, he's in there right now, but Stu, I need you to let me know. He, he's trending in the right direction to, Great. to possibly play. So, I know what that means. Yeah. So <laughs> I know that I mean, coach yeah, talk. Yep. So that that's from McVay. I mean that uh, no official designation or, or status yet as far as whether he'll, he'll play or not. But um, got an individual, got some individual. Drills, Looked great too, and, by the way. Yeah, was oh. moving was was moving well at least from I can tell what I could tell. I mean, again, uh, the full breakdown of that I'll leave to the experts and the people who are actually uh, monitoring his <laughs> workouts more closely. But um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, obviously, as we all know, if, if he if he gets back, um, that would be a huge, huge boost uh, for this offense. And I think would also, you know, help with especially some of the issues that we've seen mm -hmm. in those one possession losses where, you know, you have that, you know, that chemistry that, again, we all have known and have seen um, between him and Stafford, where they're so, very rarely, if ever, had, are they not on the same page in those situations and they can just um, you know, connect and um, get those things back on track. But yeah, so we'll see. L looking good, but uh, still to, to be determined. How does the dynamic shift if he is back in the mix offensively? I, I think it's a it's a huge it's a huge victory for not only the Rams in general, but for like Tutu Atwell, right? Who's been kind of the guy, the focal point of the passing game. Kobe Parkinson, he should be see less uh, coverage or eyes on him, and a lot of that should go there. And then I also believe you. What you've done through the last couple of weeks, he hasn't been there. You've created depth, meaning that he doesn't have to play 100 percent of the snaps. Right. Give him a break here or there as as you've gained more trust in these other guys that are making plays. And then when Puka comes back, all of a sudden now we have six guys that we can trust to go out there and roll. And we don't have to run these guys into the ground. That's a little bit. That's like from an analyst standpoint, as a coach, we always want our best guys out there. But I think those other guys have earned a lot of trust. I think Jordan Winnington's earned a ton of trust, both in the running game and the way he's blocking and also catching the ball over the middle of the field, mm -hmm. right? Running those deep in routes or crossing routes. Tutu Atwell's, again, finding ways to create separation, right? Understanding who he is. And, and it, 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 it seemed like, again, it, it felt like the Rams were kind of going away from him a little bit. And then now it's like he drug him back in. Like, look, I can still make plays and be a difference maker on this team, stretching the field vertically as well as breaking – those comebacks out of those out routes. So uh, having Cooper Cup back puts more pressure on the opposite defense because I just mentioned all these guys, and we're going to talk about another guy here in the running game soon that I think will help again, right? Mm -hmm. I think the Rams have done a great job of building this roster. It's just getting everybody out there on the same page playing at the same time. Uh, the first thing I thought of was red zone. It's been a conversation through the first five weeks of play for the Los Angeles Rams. And just to give you some numbers for Cooper Cup, he's been the number one red zone threat for the Rams, all of, except for two years when he had some injuries. But just some more numbers for you. 90 receptions on 134 targets. That's in the red zone alone for 661 yards. He has 37 red zone touchdowns. The number one threat returning, hopefully, 
to the Los Angeles Rams this week. Uh, let's talk a little defense. Actually, no, you mentioned another running back, Blake yeah. Corum. We saw the mixture. Uh, it was nice to see him out there versus Green Bay. Uh, your thoughts on his performance and how that could be maybe a two-headed monster. I thought, I thought he did an awesome job. And I um, I felt like he he's very explosive, right? You see the way he moves. Uh, I love what Kyron does. He just moves different. And maybe because he's a little fresher, a little younger. Um, Kyron does an awesome job of manipulating linebackers and, and he's great in the pass game and we, we've seen him explode, but to be able to put another guy in there to give him a break, right? Uh, I think it just makes the Rams more explosive. Um, as Blake continues to understand the offense and grow, the more confident they get in him, the more he can play, the more Matthew Stafford can be feel comfortable to check the ball down to him, right? Mm-hmm. And, and to see him to me, that draft pick was the key to this offense. Because I've been in a two-headed uh, running back room with myself and Fred Taylor, um, it was unstoppable, and we weren't the best passing team. We we like, and it's not that Cooper Cup like we had bigger guys, but we didn't throw the ball. We ran the ball eighty percent of the time, seventy percent of the time. So when you can still win 10, 12 games running the ball that like that much, imagine that with what the Rams have, mm-hmm. right? With all the motions and shifts, and be able to split those carries and how that'll carry you throughout the season, especially. You know, as our fans know, football doesn't really start counting, counting um, <laughs> until Thanksgiving. Once they get Thanksgiving hits, that's when you know where you are. That's what, that's why it's like there's so much more time left for the Rams. As soon as they, Thanksgiving hits, you're like, OK, where am I positioned now to make this run at the playoffs? Very similar to last year. Thanksgiving hit. The Rams were able to figure out where they were. Then they ran off some play uh, some games and won. So they have some time. But as long as they can continue to get healthy and get these younger guys playing offensively, I don't. I think your red zone woes will go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you become a very explosive offense where you're not having those uh, 12, 15 play drives. You'll have seven, eight, you know, five, four, mm-hmm. maybe a one play touchdown drive because you take a shot down the field or you can check the ball down and the guy can go to the house. So Blake Corum did an awesome job against the Packers. I think his his explosiveness makes this offense so much more dangerous, though. The other thing I'll say, too, about Blake Corum that I really like is you see him use those jump cuts sometimes oh. where, like, you know, there may not be something there. Kind of similar to Kyron where, yeah. like, you know, he'll use a jump cut to make something out of nothing, basically. And next thing you know, he's, you know, gaining five or six yards on a play that looks like it might be going for a loss. And that's so, what you're looking for. Yeah. So having two of those is obviously something that's especially helpful for uh, keeping the offense ahead of schedule and ahead of those change chains. All right, let's switch gears. Defensive side of the ball, we saw a bit of a different look in the secondary against the Packers. Josh Wallace in the mix. Do you expect to see a different look or maybe the same from Green Bay? We'll see. I mean, one thing that uh, McVay kind of alluded to was the fact that, you know, some of those uh, rotations and adjustments to the secondary were based on essentially how they were approaching and and preparing for the Packers. Could be a different story depending on what they see uh, on tape against the the Raiders, obviously. But uh, it sounded like from especially at the cornerback position, he's pretty happy with how that looked. And uh, it sounds like the way that they use the corners is the way that we'll continue to see that, at least for this week. Um, We'll we'll see with the with the safety position. But um, obviously, it was huge having has having Darius Williams back and uh, like I said, um, we'll, we'll see what happens in terms of like if we see more of Jalen McCullough and, and uh, Josh Wallace again like we did previously. I feel like you know something. You kind of like going around <laughs> it. Um, I, I'll say this. I, talking with the coaches early in the year, they were still trying to figure out what this secondary was going to look like. And it, and, and it feel like they don't have an answer yet. And they're still trying to figure those things out. And that's going to happen. Like, especially, like, again, we talked about it, how this defense was a work in progress. And as much as I think – as fans or as people that aren't in the building all the time or as coaches, it's like, well, you should just go with this group and just let, like, no, 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 no. Like, I think Sean McVay said it best. Competition breeds greatness. Like, you have to figure out, okay, you're not playing the best right now. We need to put someone else in and see if they can do your job. Maybe that brings the best out of you. Maybe you, 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 you know, you start to pick it up a little bit. You start to, and so to me, figuring out the, the best four that you can have back there to start in your base or the best five out there if you're a nickel is going to be important because, again, we saw the secondary kind of they've been giving up some chunk plays here and there. So you got to make sure that you you tighten that up and lock it in, whoever it may be. Um, it's going to be interesting to see this week. And then obviously on a short week after that, find a way to, to make plays. And I think that's going to be, you know, it's easy to say that. But 
having the right eyes where your eyes are supposed to be, making sure you're in the right position and have the right leverage. Those are the little things that the Rams safeties or secondary needs to, to fix and, and get right. The Rams look to solidify their run defense, and there's been a lot of conversation around the linebacking group. Do you anticipate maybe seeing Omar Spates in the mix? We'll see. I mean, I one thing I, I saw online, some of the comparisons as far as like, you know, pro football focus grades and comparing them to um, current starters versus guys who played in the preseason. And where he says, you know, like that's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. And so, uh, again, one thing that McVay had mentioned before is that, you know, if if those changes were necessary, then like basically the guys who and and it was warranted, like the guys who would be out there, like who have those opportunities would yeah. be, would be playing. But um you know, ultimately, like he's they're going to there, there could be more changes on the way. We'll see. Um, you know, he mentioned, obviously, like they're obviously cons in consideration of, you know, whatever's best for the team. And so. Who knows, does that mean more even just like a handful more snaps for Omar Spates compared to, um, you know, the basically the, the snaps that really hasn't been getting at all? Or, you know, what does that mean exactly for inside linebackers, some of these other positions? Yeah. We'll see. But um, again, and, and I, I think the other thing you have to keep in mind, too, especially with some of these position changes, I'm, I'm talking about inside linebacker because that's the one that's been generating the most conversation right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Troy Reader is the green dot, the on-field defensive signal caller. Like any adjustment you make, like that now if, if you decide to make changes there, that affects the operation, the whole operation of the defense. And so um, there are just a lot of factors in, at play between a player's readiness uh, the transition from preseasons in the regular season. Um, and Maurice, I mean, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other factors as well, but um, I don't know. How do you see that? Yeah, well, I will say this. You, first and foremost, you have to look at how the Rams allocate their resources, right? They 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 don't really allocate a lot of resource to the, the inside linebacker position, the off-ball backer. They look to outside backer. They look to corner. Uh, they love, D, obviously, D-line pressure. And so you're going to lose some there if you're not allocating resources to that position. Where if you look at the Niners, for example, they they allocate a lot of resources to the off the off uh, off ball linebacker. So it's just it's just a different philosophy. With saying that, and I understand I see all that as well, and I know there's a lot of fans that are you know clamoring for Omar Spates or changes or trades or whatever it may be. You have to understand and trust that Sean McVay and his staff they've been doing this for a long time, and Sean has an offensive mind knows how to really manipulate that position. And so he's going to put who he who they believe are going to give them the best chance to win. Um, at times, some of the guys, Rose Boom or Reader, they're not the best in space, and we know that. I mean, that's just – it's been like that since they've been here. And that's, that's – it's not saying that they can or they can't do it. It's just when you have Rose Boom match up on DJ Moore, that's a matchup that the Bears like. Mm -hmm. All right, I think DJ Moore and a lot of people, the Bears would like that situation. So you just have to find ways to put those guys in position. That's where the coaching comes in. Put them in a better position to be successful. Uh, and that's kind of going to – it may be limited you a little bit. It may not. But you want to make sure you're putting those guys in a, in a chance to have a high success rate. And I think teams have kind of – offensively a formation to put them in a position to not have as much success. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the, the issue. So maybe Omar space, the answer again, I was one of the big fans of him coming out of preseason where he was like the most physical dude I'd ever see. Like, it was awesome to see that, but I also understand the preseason. <laughs> like, right. like when I played in the preseason, it was like, look, don't touch me. I'm trying to get out of bounds. I'm just going <laughs> to give him a look and then I'm out of here. Right. And so I know it's, it's a little bit different when you get into the regular season and coaches are scheming. They have guys spending hours and hours and hours, weeks on weeks on weeks on one game, right? Uh, and I'll give our fans a quick a quick insight on it. Um, we were in Arizona, and who did we play after Arizona? We played the, Niner, the Niners, right? Who did we play after the Niners? That was Chicago. Chicago. There was a scout from Chicago at the Arizona game that I know who was scouting the Rams because they play them two weeks from now. And so they, they scout weeks ahead of time to figure out how to do this. And then they give that information to the coaching staff for that week. So understand that, you know, people are figuring out how to do that. It's just, again, you want to try to do your best as a coach to put them in the best chance to be successful. The other thing I'll add to that real quick too, is I asked McVay the other day in his press conference, like basically how do you weigh having enough of a sample size and enough health essentially at a position to know when a change is warranted versus, 
Um, it just being simply being a matter of, you know, right. getting healthy at a position in order to, you know, decide whether or not, you know, you need to make changes from a personnel standpoint. Um, and he said, let's like, that's obviously, you know, the, the balance or the difficult balance that you're trying to strike and weigh, and that, you know, it may not necessarily be wholesale changes. Um, just going back to my comment about somebody like Omar Spates earlier, it could just mean so, uh, it could be as simple as somebody like getting more snaps right. than they have before um, or being more involved in some capacity. And so um, that's something we could potentially be um, looking at, too, when it comes to whatever those personal changes may be. And I was, also, and I'll add to this. They may add a package, mm-hmm. right? So maybe it's a certain package where he comes in. And again, when you put those packages, it's, it's for him to showcase his abilities and what they're confident in. And I think that's what our fans have to understand, like. It's hard to put a player out there if you're not confident that he could do everything. So when you put him, you don't want him to lose. Again, we talk about confidence all the time. You don't want him to lose that. So whatever he's great at, that's what this package is going to kind of showcase for him. If it's he's going to play the run, well, guess what? In a rundown with a run formation, we're going to put you in so you know your gap you're fitting and you're going to do your thing. And that's just kind of how, how it goes. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to expedite us a bit here because (laughs) we are crushing it on time. Um, Let's break down the Raiders. They sit at two and four. Big news for them. Devontae Adams now gone out of the mix, but somehow they also ended up with Tom Brady as a co-owner this week. So a little bit of a mix up there. Uh, What are your thoughts uh, initially on that trade? Because he was already out with a hamstring (sighs) injury for the last three weeks. Yeah, I I feel like... um relationships kind of run their course and i think that relationship ran its course Devonte adams was he was a he was a neighbor of mine in the bay area when he was with uh he grew up in palo alto so he he was a neighbor of mine his neighbor you know who his neighbor was who Derek carr so he went to the raiders to play with Derek carr you trade Derek carr away that kind of that was the whole situation there so I, I just felt like that relationship ran dry a little bit shout out to tom telesco who was man enough to say hey listen this isn't going to work you're not happy. We're not happy. Hey, let's send you where you can be happy. We can get something back in return. Um, that's good business. Is it good business for the team? I don't. I don't think so at this point. They have a lot of injuries. Um, I know it was a Trey Tucker is going to kind of be their their guy going forward at the receiver position. Brock Bowers is a, a big weapon for them. They're struggling running the football right now offensively. So this is may, again. This may be a game where you can find some success and some traction defensively to help you out, obviously with the quarterback change as well. Yeah. Well, and especially with Adams gone now, I mean that what, even with the crazy amount of targets that Brock Bowers has already seen, there are going to be, I would imagine even more going his way now. And there's going to be an, even more increased focus on on stopping him, especially. Yeah, Brock Bowers leads all tight ends in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. That's thirty four or thirty seven receptions and three hundred eighty four receiving yards. He's already looking like he might have a Pro Bowl season. Quick insight for people: I coached him in high school. Mm-hmm. He runs a four three forty. Like people, he didn't run, but at his size and his speed in high school, he ran a four five one out of like a lineman stance. So he has the ability to run as we so we've seen him run past some guys as well. So the Rams need to make sure that they take him very serious because he is a big time player. There's also another name that sticks out as it always does. Max Crosby. He's really good. He leads the Raiders right now with five and a half sacks. How do you manage him this week? Run the football, run at him, utilize your play action pass. And I think those tight splits will really affect him. Um, to me, I, I Max Crosby is a different a different animal offensively that you have to account for. Certain guys, um, like let's say Nick Bosa, he's going to line up on the same side. He's going to line up over the left tackle all the time. You know where he's going to be. Max Crosby is going to line up all over the place. And so to me, that's, that's a little bit of a concern because he tries to find what we call Waldo, right? He's going to find the guy that he can take advantage of as much as possible and then try to get as many reps on him in passing situations as possible. Uh, if you're the Rams, how do you neutralize that? You get a good running game going. You stay ahead of the chains, like Stu said, and you find a way to play action pass and take shots, and you force him to go through multiple bodies, play after play after play. And I would add too, from a protection standpoint, maybe asking the tight ends and, and running backs to uh, chip and help no. out the tackles a little bit too, right? Yeah. Again, I, Max is a he. He has a skill set. Don't get me wrong, but his number one skill set is effort. 
he does not stop. And that's where he wears guys down. And you notice he'll get two or three sacks in like the third, fourth quarter because he's worn down the tackle. So he has a, a, a good skill set, but his number one attribute is that he's an effort guy all the time. He's 100% all the time. And so that's what scares me more, more than anything. I love it. We're all on the same page. You guys just checked off our first key to victory, which is to run the football. Let's go to our second key to victory for this matchup with the Las Vegas Raiders. Pressuring Aiden O'Connell, just his second start. He is replacing Gardner Minshew. Seven interceptions between the two of them combined, which leads the NFL. What does this team have to do to try and get him out of rhythm? Well, I just remember them winning a game against the Chiefs where I don't think he threw a pass in the last like three quarters of the game. So to me, in order to, if you want to win this game, you can't allow them to have success running the football because they will be stubborn enough just to, they'll just run it if they have to, because they know that they're, they're limited or, you know, they have an issue at the quarterback position. So if you can stop the run, I would force Aiden O'Connell to beat me. You have to beat me. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just kind of my mindset of it. Uh, you're going to have to beat me without throwing it to Brock Bowers too. Like that's like, we're going to double team him and then you got to win throwing it to everybody else. We don't care. And so uh, stopping the run. And then when you do get pressure on him, he's, he, he will take his eyes as he starts to feel pressure. He'll take his eyes um, off the receivers downfield. So again, knowing, knowing the Raiders being in that building a long time ago, uh, they're going to try to protect them as much as they can. They're going to try to run the football this week. It'd be a good week to finish those uh, or convert those pressures into tackles for loss and sacks for sure. Yeah. I love it. Uh, last and final, Stu, I'm coming to you next. Uh, we have to protect QB1, Matthew Stafford. He's given up 16 sacks this season. The offensive line has probably faced more health issues than we, well, actually there was one, one other season that we faced this exact same situation. But mm -hmm. is there a bright side to this in terms of a key to victory for this week? Yeah, I think uh, it's going to be good experience going against a pass rusher like Max Crosby, like we talked about earlier. Um, and then from a silver lining standpoint, I mean, could potentially get Joe Nopum back. He did return to practice this week. Um, again, his status for Sunday is still to be determined, but um, certainly him being back would, would help quite a bit um, with not only protect, protection against Crosby, but just overall. Uh, keeping QB one on his feet. Is he heading in the right direction? Is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, well, those were those were McVay's words. I, I don't know. I mean, he was he was lim he was limited on uh, on Wednesday. We'll see how how he looks today. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, this has been an extended cut of yeah. Between the Horns only because Jory isn't here. Happy birthday, Jory. Of course, boss man. A Happy boss birthday. Man. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I'll also say this. Uh, Sean McVay said the story is not written after five games. So Rams fans, I think it's time for a revision like last season. This is a wrap on our week seven edition of Between the Horns presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers. We can't wait to see you in SoFi Stadium come Sunday. Please.